And welcome to the Hey Boomer Show, which is live every Monday at one o'clock Eastern on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. My name is Wendy Green, and I am your host for Hey Boomer. And Hey Boomer is a show for those of us who believe we are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. It is for lifelong learners who want to find meaning and purpose in their lives and live the best part of their life in this next chapter. Every year, I put together an Alzheimer's walk team. And every year I get, you know, a bunch of people that come and walk with me and we raise money. Last year we hit the championship level. We raised over a thousand dollars. So this year I am asking you to join our team. There's a couple of ways you can do this. You can join the local team here in Greenville, South Carolina and walk with us and help raise money for that. Or you can join our our Hey Boomer team and walk in your community. So for now, I have a Greenville team. I have a Hey Boomer team in California and I have a Hey Boomer team in Maryland. And anybody that joins our team, I'm going to give them this cute Hey Boomer hat so that you can wear that when you walk and you can wear it afterwards proudly as a member of Hey Boomer. So all you have to do is go to act.alz.org forward slash go to forward slash Hey Boomer. Join our team and support the hopeful end of Alzheimer's. I also want to say that I am not anti-retirement, but I don't recommend it for almost anybody because retirement means withdrawal. And if you withdraw from life, you really are giving up on life. And what happens is that every day starts to run into the next. You become bored and lethargic. You find yourself spending more time on the couch than doing just about anything else. And I want to encourage you, as I said in the opening, this show is about living your best life in this next chapter. So I have a six-week group program called What's Next? And you can find it and more information about it on heyboomer.biz slash coaching. There you'll find a, a synopsis of what the group coaching experience is about, a little video from me, and an opportunity to sign up for a free 20-minute consultation so that I can learn more about you, you can learn more about me, and then we can make a decision whether this is a good fit for you or, or not. So there's no obligation. Check it out at heyboomer.biz slash coaching and get set or get your mojo back if you feel like you've lost it. Now to talk about what's coming up. So Kathleen A. Berry, PhD and co-editor of Unmasked, Women Write About Sex and Intimacy After 50, said, when we think of erotica, we don't usually link it together with middle-aged women. In fact, it is middle-aged women who are finally liberated to fully experience the sensuous delight of erotica. They have reached the point in their lives when they are no longer encumbered by the risk of pregnancy, nor zapped by the physical ramifications of menopause. And there's another aspect to this topic. Ageist thinking says that older women become matronly. We we lose our beauty. And the idea of older women having sex seems almost unappealing in our society. There are a few examples of, of women over 50 being sexual in the media. I'm sure that, or I hope that you all have seen Grace and Frankie with Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda. And there's a new movie out with Emma Thompson called Good Luck to You, Leo Grand. 
And in this movie, Emma Thompson plays a widow who has never had a satisfying sex life. She is curious and she is nervous. She hires a sex worker. This movie explores her journey to becoming comfortable with her own sexuality. It is available on Hulu. Good luck to you, Leo Grand. So today we're going to talk about the idea that we are all sensual beings into our 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, and that we can all make our own decisions about what is right for us regarding sex at this stage of our life, really at any stage of our life. So let me bring Stella on and introduce you. Hello, Stella. Hi, Wendy. Thanks for having me. Oh, I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> And so is the audience. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch. <laughs> so brief bio, Stella is a former biotechnology writer who advocates for the creative power of older women. Her books include Aphrodite's Pen, The Power of Writing Erotica After Midlife, The Erotic Pandemic Ball, and, oh, did you hear the thunder? Mm-hmm. And her debut novel at age 68, Charm, Brilliant Charming Bastard. She is currently teaching romance writing to seniors and writing a book about creative retirement. Stella lives with her partner in North Carolina. You can follow her on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And she blogs on her website, which we will get to. And I'll share all of her contact information later. Hmm. So Stella, yes. So you know, in my coaching practice, I always talk to people about reinvention, mm -hmm. and many people have a really hard time thinking about what they're going to do next. You know, they they had their career, and they that was that was who they defined themselves as. They didn't have an idea of what was next. So I'm curious about your reinvention journey from tech mm -hmm. writer to writer of erotica mm -hmm. and the ups and downs of that. Okay. Well, I always wanted to be a writer. In fact, my childhood goal was to write my first novel by the time I was 25. So I, I missed that by <laughs> what, 50 <Two> plus years. <laughs> <laughs> but as you said, it's never too late. So um, I went to college in the early 70s when um, there was a total double standard about writing anything sexual. Philip Roth's novels were literature. Erica John's novels were trash. And so that's, that's what it was like when I came up. And I certainly never thought about writing erotica back then. Um, after college, after I got my uh, degree in creative writing, which when I moved to New York, I was told would get me, uh, if I had that plus 25 cents, I could get a ride in the subway. Mm -hmm. So I went back to school, got a master's in biology and had a career writing FDA submissions, which are about as asexual as you can get. <laughs> and uh, when I was starting to think about uh, graduating from that career, if we don't like the word retirement, maybe we can call yeah. it re graduation. Um, I happened to read an article in the New York Times book review section by a romance author who was also in her late 50s, who was advising her sister writers that if they wanted to get published, they should write romance characters in their 20s. And I thought, that's pretty outrageous. Why should women of a certain age have to closet themselves when they write? And around that time, a friend of mine, Lynx Cannon, started a reading series in, at an Oakland bookstore called Dirty Old Women. And she invited all her friends to write erotic stories and come and read them before an audience. And I thought, well, why not? So <laughs> that's, that's how this started. So, I mean, I think if you asked me to come to a book reading and writing erotic stuff called Dirty Old Women, I would probably be pretty nervous. Were you nervous at first? Yeah, I sure was. But, you know, we had a great crowd every time, and it was really a mixed age crowd. There were a lot of 
younger women in the audience who would come up to us afterwards and thank us and say, you know, we, we thought that part of life ended around age 40. So <laughs> thank you for showing us that that's not the case. I, I, I've come to think of this kind of writing as a political act, really, as part of our part of liberating ourselves. So a political act and, and an educational act in a sense for the young people mm -hmm. that there's, you can continue to look forward to this. <laughs> That's right. But this doesn't just, there's not a, you know, there's not a cutoff date. Right, right. So in Aphrodite's pen, you talk about the power of writing erotica as older women. Yeah. What do you mean by that power? Well, I think, I think there are a couple of kinds of power involved. One is the power to claim back our narrative for ourselves. You mentioned earlier that there's this, there's this idea in the culture, there's this sexist ageist trope that older women um, have outlived their own sexuality. And when we write, even if, even if a woman writes a story and saves it for herself, she's reclaiming her own agency because you know, sexuality isn't something society gives us or something society can take away. It's innate in us. And when we write, we reclaim that for ourselves. And mm -hmm. if we decide to publish a story, then we're pushing back on this big cultural narrative. I think of, I think of culture as sort of like an ocean liner, you know, it's going in one direction. It's big, has a lot of, there's a lot of inertia. But if, if everybody gets out their teaspoon, writes their story, and starts, you know, pushing the water, we can, we can start turning the culture in a better direction if a lot of us are writing our stories. Well, if you've never written anything like that before, yeah, how would you even get started? Well, I, I think, you know, um, if you're not in a community that has, you know, a dirty old women reading series... <laughs> You can still, you can certainly get a copy of uh, Aphrodite's Pen, which has exercise, writing exercises, writing prompts, all kinds of ideas for how to create characters, how to mine your own life experience. Because by now, all of us have lots and lots of experience that we can draw from in creating plots and creating characters. And then the book also has interviews with women older women who write erotica talking about their experience and examples of stories that they've written. So you can really get a sense of, of this, what I think of as a developing crone culture. Hmm. Hmm. So I, I have to tell you, I mean, I was so a naive, I guess is the right word about all of this. Yeah. Um, you know, I was I was thinking that well, there's not really gonna be much of a plot. It's just gonna be one sexual act after another. Well, and and when I read your book, Brilliant Charming Bastard, there was quite an involved plot there. <laughs> and not nearly as much sex as I expected there to be, and it was tastefully managed. So it was a big surprise to me. And you called this form of um this genre of writing. Like, what did you call it? Elderotica. Elderotica and, and the way they categorize it. Oh, seasoned. Well, there's, there's a, there is a category seasoned romance. Seasoned so, romance. Yeah. So when I was speaking earlier about that article I read by that, the, the woman uh, advising other women writers to make their characters young, she was writing romance, which is a really structured form um, and I sort of thought I was writing romance when I wrote Brilliant Charming Bastard. But now that I'm teaching about romance, I realize that I did not follow the rules. Romance, romance has a very set structure for how you set up your plot and how your characters interact and what happens at the end. And it's really about um, a happily ever after ending. Um, and my book is more, I would, you know, people hate the, pe a lot of people hate the phrase women's literature, but I think mine is more like seasoned women's literature. Mm. But yes, there is a whole category now called seasoned romance. Publishers are realizing 
that we are a big market. There are a lot of people now, more and more people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and we don't necessarily want to read about people in their 20s. Right. So what's the difference then between seasoned romance and Eldorotica? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, so if you think about, again, if you think about what romance is, it's, it's really centered around one relationship between two people and they have to have a happily ever after ending. Erotica is more like how one person uh, develops, one main character develops through her sexual experiences and, and becomes a, a, a more fully developed person by the end of the story. So it's, it's, a, it's a different it's a different genre. And then there's porn, which is a whole different thing. Right, right, right. So I would say that Good Luck to You, Leo Grand is Eldorotica. Have you seen it? Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because she definitely develops into a, a more fuller person. Yes. And she's really developing her relationship with herself. Yes. Um, not that the other person is objectified because he's not, I think he's, he's, he's a fully developed character in his own right. But, but the, the real theme of the story is that she comes into her own, as you said earlier. Yeah. So, so yeah, I guess it is sort of, it is Eldorotica. I hadn't thought yeah. of that. I liked yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I so, loved it. It's a um, movie. It is. I mean, at first I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, but yeah, it was and so brave. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so talking about objectification. Yeah. All right. So when we're young, you know, mm -hmm. society, I mean, sex sells and ads, right. They encourage young women to dress sexy, wear the highest heels, you know, all mm -hmm. and it is a very objectified way of gaining attention. Mm -hmm. As older women, of course, we still want to look lovely and sexy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we do that so that our minds are not telling us, yeah, but that's just objectifying yourself? That's that's a really interesting question. I think I think there comes a point in most of our lives where we can walk past a construction site without being harassed. And <laughs> And, you know, that is, you know, people talk about invisibility of older women. There is that upside. There is that freedom. And in that freedom, I really think there's an opportunity, again, to, to look at our own agency, to claim our own sexual being, and to not feel like we're always having to fend off unwanted attention. So I, I like to look at the freedom side of it. And, and once we've once we're kind of in that state, once we're in that stage, when we reclaimed our freedom, then I think it gives us room to be more playful in our relationships because, because we have freed ourselves of that concern about being objectified. Um, not that, you know, I mean, you can, you can play with objectification in a consensual relationship. Uh -huh. That's something, uh, there's that wonderful book, Mating in Captivity, that talks about, talks about that. But, but again, I really think that this notion of invisibility has a huge positive aspect for us as, as women. That's a great way to phrase it. Yeah, because we don't have to, <laughs> we don't have to be harassed walking down the street. No. But we can be free and playful on our own terms when mm -hmm. we want to, with mm -hmm. whom we want to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I know. We've got a big thunderstorm coming up here. Thor, Thor, Thor agrees with you. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, so talking about the women's movement and the whole discussion about ageism now, you and I have both been involved in, in those discussions in larger forums. And, yeah. you know, the societal myth, of women losing their sexuality, like you talked about with the young people. So I'm curious how you think writing about sexuality or erotica or reading about it even can, 
can help in that, you know, dispelling some of those ageist myths. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we all grew up with women our age grew up swimming in this gendered ageist soup without even realizing it. I mean, think about, you know, Sleeping Beauty and Maleficent. Think mm -hmm. about Cinderella and the Wicked Stepmother. I mean, we, we absorbed a lot of that before we were old enough to have maybe have clear thinking about the fact that we weren't always going to be Cinderella's age. Someday we were going to be the age of the stepmother. And what did that mean for us? So, um, so when we step back from those myths and start creating our own myths, I think that really gives us a lot of power and um, it gives us a, a, a new voice that's important for us as older women. So I think it's key to seek out, if you, as a reader, as a, a watcher of movies and shows, I mean, you mentioned some really powerful, significant shows. There are a lot of great books out there. Um, I mentioned Erica Jong earlier. She wrote uh, Fear of Flying as a Young Woman. She wrote Fear of Dying as an Older Woman, which is a, a great uh, novel with a lot of sexuality about being in our 60s. These are ways that we can reclaim our, our power through reading and writing and kind of um, we can reprogram ourselves away from all that sexist ageist stuff that we were exposed to when we were young. Yeah, I do think there's power in that. You know, when we, when we stay in our own heads and, and tell ourselves the same old story over and over again, which we bought into because that's how we were raised. Seeing other examples like Grace and Frankie, like mm -hmm. Leo Grand, you know, you start to say, oh, well, there are other ways to look at this. And I love Erica Young. Yeah. Yeah, she's great. And, you know, there, there are more and more women writing from that vantage point now. Um, uh, Carolyn Lee Arnold has a new memoir out called 50 First Dates After 50, which, which is really fun. I got, hmm. to, I got to interview her from my blog recently. There's, and that's just one example. I have on my website, I have a whole list of references for movies, shows, and books, because I really think it's important as a, as a consumer of culture to be mindful of what we are consuming and, and look at the positive aspects of this part of our lives because there are plenty of negative stories out there. Right, right. I think I'll try to link to that in the show notes. Oh, that good. Would, yeah, because that would that'd be good for everybody. Okay. So you're teaching a, a course now. Yeah. What is that course? It's called Thee and Me Could Write a Bad Romance. <laughs> what is that about? <laughs> So, um, so I, one day I just, on a, on a whim, I put up something on LinkedIn saying, I'm thinking about teaching this class, the and me could write a bad romance. And a woman from uh, an organization that provides uh, lots of content for, for older folks um, wrote to me and said, oh, great, we want you to come teach this class. Well, of course, I had no curriculum. I just... <laughs> I just had this title. So that's when I started learning what romance is actually about as a genre and that I actually had not written one. I thought I did, but I didn't. So, so I put together a curriculum. Uh, it's eight weeks long and we've been looking at the whole structure of romance, what act one looks like, act two looks like, act three looks like, how to build uh, characters, how to build a uh, plot, how to make your scene uh, conform to what you're looking for, how to construct dialogue that works, the whole, the whole thing. So it's, it's been a lot of fun and I'm, I'm looking forward to offering it again for a, a wider audience later on. And are most people going to end the course with a written story? Well, they're, they've, they won't end with full drafts of romance novels, but they'll end with a lot. They have, Everybody by now has 
a, a schematic with every scene they're going to write. They, they have um, descriptions of their main characters, their supporting characters. Uh, they have a lot of their scenes written. And um, now they're working on love scenes, which is fun. That's great. Yeah. So, so can they find out about this on your website? It's not up there yet. No. Um, I will. I will put it up there because, um, I, as I said, I do want to offer this again uh, in the fall. I'll be offering this class. Okay. So Stella's website is Stella Foss F O S S E dot com, mm -hmm. um, and you can sign up for her newsletter mm -hmm. at page dot Stella Foss dot com forward slash what's hyphen new. And you don't have to worry about that because as soon as you get in the website, you'll start getting these annoying invitations <laughs> <laughs> to sign up for the blogs and the newsletter. Yeah. So they're fun to read too. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, okay. So just a couple more questions. This one's a little bit more. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay realistic let's say all right all right so you're writing erotica right mm -hmm. sex mm -hmm. at this stage of your life our lives mm -hmm. is not always easy mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. women are not lubricating the way they used to men are not getting erections like they used to and mm -hmm. sometimes our knees hurt trying to get into position so I mean, you could make a comedy erotic story about that, but I'm wondering how you handle that in a, yeah. an erotic story. That's a really good question. So, <laughs> so there's a woman named Joan Price who writes, uh, she writes a senior advice column for, uh, for Senior Planet on sexuality. And she's written also some great books, um, including one called Naked at Our Age, which I highly recommend. Um, and she uh, reviews, by the way, she reviews sex toys from the standpoint of an older person and recommends vibrators and all kinds of sex toys. So she's a wonderful resource. I, I really recommend her. And when I re so, so I like to think about this from the flip side. I like to think about uh, if I'm looking at what she has to say about senior sexuality, then what is it that works well for us at this stage? And, and focus on that. So for example, in one of her books, she talks about that, um, that men have uh, past a certain age do really well um, sexually if they're standing because of the way blood flows. So, so that inspired me to write a story in which uh, a couple in their 60s, at the end of the story, there's a, there's a love scene where they're leaning against a vibrating dishwasher while they're, mm -hmm. you know, they've been in the kitchen talking and then they end up doing that. So, so I think there are ways to incorporate the positives, the things that do work well into our writing. So, and again, I really, I really recommend Joan. I think she's a great, she's a great resource. Yeah. Thanks. I have to check that out. And you um, put up a quote from Anderson Cooper, <laughs> which I thought was hysterical. Um, his mother, Gloria Vanderbilt, was 85 when she said to him, I'm going to write an erotic novel. And he said those were the seven most horrifying words he'd ever heard. <laughs> I haven't asked my kids how they would feel if I was to announce that. Maybe I will ask them. Um, but well, how did your sons or daughters or yeah. how did your kids respond to this? You know, I, I, I love it when I love that quote. And um, when I put that up on Facebook, uh, I'm Facebook friends with Janet Hardy, uh, who some of your readers may know as the author of uh, The Ethical Slut, a book that came out quite a while ago about polyamory. And and so she, <laughs> uh, my comment was, oh, my poor babies. And then and then her answer was, oh, mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but actually the the interesting thing is so that's so Stella Foss is a pen name and the reason I chose a pen name is that I didn't want to embarrass my adult children any more than necessary but they've actually been pretty cool about it in fact one of my daughters who's a professional uh designer 
designed the cover for Brilliant Charming Bastard. So oh, yeah. I think that they I think that they um they like the idea of empowering older women and that this is a way to do it. And after all, you know, I have two sons and two daughters. My daughters are gonna be older women at some point too. So so I think they get it, surprisingly. Have they read your books? No. <laughs> <laughs> No way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, no. not necessary, huh? <laughs> no, no, they, no, that's not for them. So what's next for you? What's it coming down the pike? Well, I am in the middle of writing a book about creative retirement with a friend of mine, uh, Stevie Jane Parks, who is a, a psychotherapist and an abstract painter. So uh, she took up abstract painting after she, her uh, former career was winding down. So, so we're, we're in the middle of doing that. We're, um, we're writing about lots of different topics, everything from uh, housing to sexuality, to creativity and play to um, just everything you can think of movement. Um, and so that's great fun. And we're collecting uh, anecdotes to include in that book from a, a lot of uh, older women who've, who've, taken on new adventures uh, after 60. So that's big fun. I also have decided that if I'm going to teach about romance, I'd better actually write <laughs> a romance that <laughs> actually is a romance. <laughs> so um, so in, the in, the, in teaching this class, I've come up with uh, an outline that I used as an example, and it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a vampire romance. So. Ooh. So that can be pretty sexy, actually. That'll be, that'll be fun. There's already one out there. There's a there's a really good one out there called Forever Fifty One. Oh, about, I don't know that. It's about a uh, a woman who becomes a vampire in the middle of menopause. So she's she's permanently in the throes of menopause. <laughs> it's very it's very fun to read. Oh gosh. Um, now you mentioned earlier that some. Some like if you really wanted to try and learn how to do this, you know, mm -hmm. certainly your book Aphrodite's Pen is one way, but mm -hmm. you also talked about writing groups. So I know you had some great groups out in California. Mm -hmm. Now you're in your new home in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Are you finding other women that you can form a group with and write with? Um, I'm in, I'm I'm involved in so in North Carolina we have this wonderful organization called the North Carolina Writers Network, which is a statewide organization. There are there are like you know you couldn't throw a rock without hitting a writer in North Carolina. There's so many. Uh, so I'm involved in the local chapter of that statewide organization. When I first got there, you know, I walked in with a stack of Aphrodite's pen, which had just come out at that point. And I think they were somewhat taken aback by that. <laughs> I bet they were. This California girl, what's up with her? <laughs> but they've gotten used to me and I'm on the steering committee for that local organization now. So I think they've decided they can tolerate me after all. But uh, at this point, I would say a lot of, there's so much opportunity online to work with other writers all over the country. Um, for example, I really recommend anybody who's interested in getting involved in writing to sign up with National Novel Writing Month or NaNoWriMo, which is based uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. People are people all over the country are writing first novels through NaNoWriMo, and uh, actually, I have a, there. There are lots of local subgroups through NaNoWriMo, and there also are um, topically related groups. So for example, I have one in there for um, El Dorotica writers. Hmm. There, there are lots of opportunities, uh, no matter where you live. Yeah, the pandemic has changed things so much that mm -hmm. doing things virtually is so much closer to the norm now than it was a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. It's so true. That's so yeah. true. It's really, really opened up a lot of opportunities for for folks our age to do many things that we wouldn't have been able to do before. So how does that work? Say like, I will like say this, I, right? Well, yeah, like, but say I've never written before, right? Yeah. I write a blog, but say I've never written a book. I've fantasized about it, but yeah, 
you know, I would like to want to creep in and sit in the very back row and like, don't ask me anything. Let me just listen. Um, harder to do on a virtual screen, but yeah. Um, how does it work when you join a writing group? Um, well, a couple things. One is, you know, there are books you can get that will just help you launch into writing from, you know, starting from zero. And my favorite, is, and this is not about erotica, but my favorite book to, to introduce people to writing in general is called Writing Open the Mind. It's by Andy Couturier. And it has all kinds of ideas and exercises for helping people look at writing as play and not judge themselves. And, and that's really key when you're, when you're writing a first draft, when you're first getting involved in writing, to set aside your inner critic and, and be playful about your writing. So that's how I approach writing, teaching writing. That's how I'm approaching V and me could write a bad romance. Um, Cause it doesn't matter if your first draft is bad. It, it's just play and you know, it's fine. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to find a safe, if you're going to find a writing group, it's important to find one that's a safe space where people are going to give you feedback that encourages you to keep going and not, mm -hmm. not nitpick. And, um, and when I, when I run a writing group, I ask folks to give the following kind of feedback, listen to what the person is reading you and then um, write down the phrases that really grab you that seem really significant to you. Write down what you like and give the person that feedback. That will help them to keep going. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think, I think those things are really significant. Yeah, sometimes one or two phrases of compliments can mm -hmm. take away some of that fear. So yeah, yeah. 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 Well, this has been this has been really interesting. You know, I have <laughs> I have read and watched more erotica this past <laughs> week or so getting ready for this show <laughs> and probably ever. And it's really been interesting, though, Stella. It has helped. It has opened my eyes and acceptance in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. And yeah, yeah. it's yeah. been fun. Yeah, you know, uh, Maggie Kuhn, who founded the Grey Panthers, had this motto, learning in sex until rigor mortis. <laughs> <laughs> keep that. learning, keep having sex. That's the best advice ever. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we went on, you uh, we talked about possibly you gifting a couple of uh, downloads of your book, your newest book, yeah. to some yeah. of our listeners. Do you want to tell people how you do it? And I will uh, sure. share your email address. Sure, I'm happy to, to do that. So the first three folks who write to me at Stella at StellaFoss.com, be happy to send you a, um, an e-copy of Brilliant Charming Bastard. So just uh, just get on there and write to me. Um, the book will come from BookBub, and it may go into your spam or junk folder. So if you don't see the book in the next day or two, please check your, your spam and junk folders. Make sure that it's not um, hiding there. And if that doesn't work, write to me again and let me know, and I'll, we'll, we'll sort it out. So, okay, so it's the first three people. First so three. so three. you can't wait. We have more than that. We have a bunch of people watching. So oh, it's, good. yeah, it's Stella at Stella Foss, F O S S E dot com. That's so right. Drop her a note right now. Yeah. Get started on Brilliant Charming Bastard. <laughs> yeah. And, and I hope that lots of folks will sign up for the blogs and emails and also look look for the resources tab on the website because again we have lots of movies shows and books that talk about the positives uh around uh, senior sexuality from a fictional standpoint and also i have i have some of joan price's 
books up there as resources too. Awesome. Well, thank you for what you're doing, Stella. Well, it's fun. It's a fun revolution. I like to say. It's a fun revolution. So I always ask my guests um, for two or three takeaways. Okay. So what would you like to leave the audience with? All right. Uh, the first is what the, one of the things we've been talking about this whole time, and that is read books and watch movies that show the possibilities of this part of life. It's easy to find the negative stuff, but if we're going to reprogram ourselves and look at the bright side, it's important to find those, those books and movies and shows. Um, and I'd say Carolyn Arnold's new memoir, 50 First Dates After 50, would be a great place to start. That sounds like fun. The second thing is find ways to build creativity into your life, whatever works for you, whether that's cooking or painting or writing. And, um, uh, and find people who enjoy the same thing you do so you can uh, reinforce each other, share, share information and resources and successes. And as I said earlier, National Novel Writing Month is a great free way to get involved if writing is a way that you want to be creative. The third thing is enjoy your body. Your body's a good gift. And, um, you know, I, I, I took up weightlifting in my 60s. It's marvelous. Um, talk about helping you feel powerful. Um, go swimming. Buy a vibrator. I mean, you know, look at Joan Price's recommendations and and find something that works for you. And uh, again, remember what Maggie Kuhn said, learning in sex until rigor mortis. <laughs> Great advice. Thank you, Maggie Kuhn. <laughs> Maggie. She's, if, you, if you read her autobiography, she certainly took her own advice. She did. All right. So um, we've been, I've been sharing Stella's website information. Um, again, you can email her at Stella at StellaFoss.com. So hopefully you get lots and lots of yeah. emails and questions and check out the resource page, like she said. Absolutely. Um, join our walk to end Alzheimer's. <laughs> yes. The link for that is act.alz.org forward slash go to forward slash. Hey, boomer and join the team contribute to, uh, try and end this awful disease. Um, you know, it's certainly look, our parents or us could be looking at that at some point and we don't want to. Mm -hmm. Um, connect with me about the what's next coaching program, the six week group coaching program at heyboomer.biz slash coaching. I'd love to talk to you 20 minutes, 20 minutes that could change your life <laughs> and really give you some insights into, uh, what's next for you. So check that out. This guest has been amazing. Well, thank you. Yes. And thank, thank you. you for Ah, thank you for joining us. It's such an interesting conversation. And um, I want to tell you about my guest for next week. Her name is Manette Norman. And we're calling the show Jumping Off into the Great Unknown. Mm. So both Manette and I have done this more than once. And we are going to share our stories and our experiences together. As we're going to, we talked about kind of interviewing each other. So that should be an interesting experiment. Um, Manette's LinkedIn profile says she helps leaders cultivate inclusive teams. She's a keynote speaker, a psychological safety certified practitioner, and an upcoming author. And I thought, how cool is that, that she claimed it before her book's out there. I am an upcoming author. So I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And like Stella modeled for us today, and like we all strive for, live with passion, live with relevance, and live with courage. Mm -hmm. My name is Wendy Green, and this has been Hey Boomer. <laughs>